Adventic Central Methodist Church welcomes you to this time of worship this morning. We pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, you have revealed yourself as creator and savior and sustainer, our Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. You live and reign in perfect unity of love. Help us, O oh God, to hear your word to us today. Hold us firm in our faith that we truly may know your ways. And not only know your ways, but walk in your ways. And not only walk in your ways, but love your ways. That we may ever more rejoice in your eternal glory, you who are one, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. As we bring our worship and praises to God, we say this creed together that comes from Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5. We say together in faith, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. We believe in God, the Father who created all things, for by his will they were created and have their being. We believe in God the Son who was slain, for with his blood he purchased us for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. We believe in God the Holy Spirit. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen.
please do have a look at our bulletin. There's quite a bit of news in it. Have a look and see how you can participate in the life of the church. There will be again on Wednesday a short video and some reflection questions that will be set on our uh, email and WhatsApp uh, as we take a journey of discipleship uh, during this time of Lent. Look out for that as well. Also, happy birthday to those who have had birthdays in this past week. May God richly bless you in the year that is to come. Our lectionary today takes us again to Mark's Gospel and we read today the first passage where Jesus speaks very openly and plainly about his death. Mark 8 and we read from verse 31 to the end of the chapter. Mark 8, 31 Then Jesus began to teach his disciples the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. He will be put to death, but three days later he will rise to life. He made this very clear to them. So Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But Jesus turned round, looked at his disciples and rebuked Peter. Get away from me, Satan, he said. Your thoughts don't come from God, but come from human nature. Then Jesus called the, the, the crowd and his disciples to him. If anyone wants to come with me, he told them, he must forget self, carry his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his own life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Do people gain anything if they win the whole world, but lose their life? Of course not. There is nothing they can give to regain their life. If a person is ashamed of me and of my teaching in this godless and wicked day, then the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in glory of the Father with the, the holy angels. Chapter 9, verse 1. And he went on to say, I tell you, there, there are some here who will not die until they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Thanks be to God for this word to us today. There is a saying in the English language that you might be very familiar with. It says, easy come, easy go. I'm sure you know it. If you obtain something with effort, you will probably do everything in your power to keep it. But if it was easy to get, it's easy not to value it. It happens, for example, with people who win money on gambling, who spend it recklessly and very soon are left with less than ever before. It's one of the threats with the way we sometimes talk about faith in Jesus. He died on the cross. He paid the price. He gave his life. All you need to do is to say the Jesus prayer and, hey, presto, you have an apartment in heaven at no cost. Your investment is secure. No, just do what you like for now. Doesn't matter. Live the way you like. Grace is automatic and eternal life is in the bag. Jesus speaks very strongly against this easy come, easy go attitude. It's this mentality that makes faith to be meaningless, that makes grace to be cheap, and that prevents faith from becoming the center of your life, prevents faith from growing like those seeds in the parable of Jesus that fell on the good soil and dug in deep and grew roots and grew strong. One of the great Christians of the 20th century was a man by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a Lutheran minister who died in a Nazi prison, executed before the age of 40, because his faith meant more to him than his life. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, go and Google him. It's well worth reading what he had to say. He brings the gospel message of Jesus in all its power by saying that in essence, 
Grace is definitely free, but it's never cheap. The first of three times in Mark's Gospel that Jesus speaks clearly about his death puts his thoughts into perspective. The grace of God is costly. It is costly because it cost Jesus his life. When you listen to Jesus in Mark chapter 8, you understand that his death was no accident. He wasn't in the wrong place at the wrong time. Jesus knew what was coming. He could have avoided death by stopping to love sinners, by stopping to declare the grace and the embrace of God. But he could not deny his father. He could not step away from his life's purpose, even when it meant death. What cost so much for Jesus cannot be cheap for us even if it's free. Can you see then why Jesus spoken just a minute ago from his heart about what was about to happen to him? He starts talking also to those who love him and those who follow him and he speaks to them about the cross that they must carry. Mark 8 verse 34. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples it's a very important thought. He called the crowd to him. This wasn't just a message for the closest 12. This was for everybody who was going to follow him. And he said to them, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. Let's be clear. Taking up your cross is not just doing something that you don't feel like doing. Having to go to work on a Monday morning isn't a cross to bear. It's just what you have to do. It's also more than putting up with a difficult circumstance in your life. An irritable teenager in the house is not a cross to bear. It's just part of life. Bearing your cross is choosing to willingly follow Jesus. And that might cost you. It might cost you your job because you refuse to play corruption games. It might cost you a relationship. It might cost you comfort. You know, young people, you know well, you, you meet a beautifully stunning young woman and she makes you feel so good and her attention makes your heart beat faster and you can't believe how lucky you are till she laughs at you when you suggest she comes to church or when you want to go home early on a Saturday night because you have to be at church on Sunday morning for choir practice and suddenly you have to make a choice to take up your cross is to choose to be obedient to Jesus to follow his way it is to be committed to his values when you take up your cross your hands are full. You've got no space for anything else in your hand but the cross of Jesus that you are bearing. Jealousy, vanity, pride, selfishness, greed. Just can't find a grip in your life because you have chosen the cross. But let me help us understand the joy of the cross. You know, the more mature you grow in your faith, the more you will come to terms with what seems to be the contradictions in our faith. There's pain in the cross. But there's joy in the cross. There's peace in the cross. There's life in the cross. Carrying your cross means that you are ready to die with Jesus. Because in him, death means life. Let me take you to Romans chapter 6. Romans is not a simple book to understand. And so if you want to 
find it in your Bible and follow it with me and read it again later on, it might not be a bad thing. Romans 6, we read verse 4 to 11. It's about dying with Jesus. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have new life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a re resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might not be done away with. My, sorry, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has any mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. The cross means death, but in the same breath, the cross means life. So in carrying your cross, does it mean death or does it mean life? In carrying your cross, does it mean agony or does it mean joy? In carrying your cross, does it mean failure or fulfillment? In carrying your cross, is it about a burden or is it about a privilege? Jesus goes on to say in Mark 8 verse 35, the very next verse, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Here's another contradiction. You save your life by losing it says Jesus. Picture it in this very mundane way. You save a banana for two weeks because you think this is such a beautiful sweet yellow banana. Let me save it for a while. You will find that in two weeks it has changed color and it's become a pulpy mush. There is some mold growing on it and it has become useless. Saving it meant losing it. The gospel warns us, hold back on love, be careful with kindness, stop being generous, try and save for yourself everything and you will find that your soul is dying. On the contrary, show the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Be liberal with love and with joy and with patience and with generosity. Give as much as you can. Let the Spirit flow through you. Don't stop blessing. Hold nothing back. Give and you will find that you will live. It's a, it's a little bit like this. Sitting in a pitch dark room with a candle by your side and a packet of matches. But you refuse to light the candle. You'd rather stumble in the dark. You rather will walk blind and bump into furniture because you want to save the candle. You want to save the candle and sit in the dark all night? Why? Because by saving the candle, you lose the whole evening. Or will you light that candle and see? Sacrifice the candle. Let it burn down because in exchange you can see and walk and dance and read and live. Let your life be a gift to the Lord. Let your life be like that candle that you are willing to light and let it burn out. Because while it burns, you are giving life and joy and blessing to all around. Give what you can. Give what you are. Say yes to blessing others, even when it comes at a price. Because by giving your life, 
to gain it for eternity. May God bless you in these days as we contemplate Lent and what it means for each one of us to take up our cross and follow Jesus. Decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.